A reading from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water parted to one to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, 
and it is veiled to those who are perishing. In the case of the God from this world, what binded the minds of all the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and as ourselves, as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let the light shine out the darkness, who has shown in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory Glory to you. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared with him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we are at the transfiguration of our Lord. It is always the, uh, the Sunday that precedes Lent. It is at, always at the end of the time after the Epiphany. We have this moment uh, just of, of a festival just before we enter into the time of Lent. And you just heard the story. Uh, and, and, and Elijah's appearance there is probably the reason why we heard about Elijah's story uh, at the beginning uh, of, of the readings where Elijah is taken up into heaven. Uh, and so there's been this anticipation of when Elijah would return, because in that story he doesn't die, he's just kind of removed from being on earth. So there was this expectation that Elijah might return. And so, uh, after the baptism of Jesus, we hear people questioning whether or not John the baptizer is Elijah returned, and he says, no, that's, that's not who I am. And so there's, there's been this expectation, and now here's the moment on this mountaintop, these select group of disciples see Jesus transfigured into a kind of ultimate brilliance, just to underscore, uh, so that people don't think, uh, I guess, is what the, the gospel writers think, just so they don't think Jesus got his clothes laundered all of a sudden. Uh, Mark, especially here in this reading, underscores that his, the brilliance of his clothing is so bright, it's brighter than anyone could have made it by bleaching it. In other words, this is... This is not some sort of natural process that has occurred. It is, in fact, really weird, in a good way, but still weird. And so I've spent all week wondering what this could mean for us. Like, I get it for its place uh, among the first readers, because part of what this text is saying is here is Jesus and whom the Gospel of Mark has already said, this is the good news. This person, Jesus, is the good news. And so part of what's going on in this mountaintop experience, because if you've read through the Hebrew Scriptures, then you're familiar with the fact that people like Moses and Elijah go to mountaintops to experience God. And so part of what's being said is, here is Elijah, the primary prophet, the the big-name prophet, 
for the Hebrew people, and Moses, the lawgiver. Like, this is a sign of a kind of super continuity with everything that God has done before for God's people. And so sure, there's that part of it. And there's all this brilliance and shining going on that seems to say this person is really important. And I wonder what it means for us because we're here in this building this morning instead of getting ready for Taylor Swift's big event. <laughs> I mean the Super Bowl. Um, and, and, and so we're, we're here in this space, and that kind of indicates we're people who already have figured out there's something important about Jesus. So what is the story doing for us? Uh, so we've, we've heard, uh, we've been hearing, and we heard this story from the Gospel uh, of Mark. Uh, and if, if you've heard me talk about the Gospel of Mark before, then you've heard this story, I apologize. But there's this thing that we call the Markin sandwich. And we, I mean academics and people who, who study too much minutia. But we call it the Markin sandwich. And what that is, is, uh, is that Mark likes to take a story and cut it in half and stick another story in the middle of the, uh, of the original story. And he does that as, as a way of editing these stories together in, in hopes that putting these stories together in such a way that's clearly intentional, that he hopes you will understand both stories uh, in light of one another. In other words, he thinks that, that, that this story is explaining that story and vice versa. So Mark and Sam. I think the reality is the whole gospel of Mark is, in fact, a giant club sandwich of stories. Uh, and that here we have a kind of middle point in the sandwich. We heard at the beginning when Jesus is baptized uh, that there is a voice. You know, there's, there's not a cloud, but there is something like a dove that comes down and and depending on how you translate it, either lands on Jesus or enters into Jesus, and that is the Holy Spirit. And then we have a voice, and it's not clear from the way that, that Mark tells the story if anybody else got to hear the voice. But there's this voice that says, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. And now, and, and then, then you, get, uh, you get John the baptizer and people asking, are you Elijah? And then let's skip over the story we just heard all the way to the end at the crucifixion. It's not a cloud again, but it's darkness that descends upon the face of the earth at the crucifixion. Jesus cries out with a loud voice. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and at the baptism, the heavens were torn apart. And here at the crucifixion, the veil and the temple is torn apart. And then the people ask, is he crying out for Elijah? And then we come back. We're going to bounce back now to the middle of the story where we are with this transfiguration. And we have a cloud that descends and a voice that everybody gets to hear this time that says, this is my son, and who am I well pleased? Listen to him. And Elijah is there. And so there's a way in which these stories are connected and are mirroring one another. Um, and, and, and instead of a torn garment or a torn heaven, you have clothing that is immensely brilliant. So it seems that Mark is weaving these together as, as kind of guideposts through this series of stories that he's trying to tell about who this is. But again, I've been wondering all week, what does it mean for us? We're here. We understand that this person, Jesus, is important. I hope we understand that he is in continuity with everything that God has done before. And I think, actually, it's its placement liturgically that kind of gives us a hint about how we might read the story. That is, that it comes just before Lent. 
Lent being a time of uh, fasting and, and renewal and repentance and study uh, and, and all these disciplines that is kind of honing our, ourselves to be disciples of Jesus, uh, that is, you know, it starts out with ashes. Um, if <clears throat> I found this meme, which I thought was just beautiful, that uh, kind of gets the spirit of this. Um, as I have said, uh, Ash Wednesday and, and Valentine's Day are going on a date this year, the, the same day. And, uh, and so somebody posted this, thing, this image. And, and it, uh, the, the Rock, uh, it's from that, that the kid's spy movie. The Rock is looking at the back going, so what are you doing for Valentine's Day? Uh, and the girl in the back says, I'm rubbing dirt on people's faces and reminding them that they're going to die. <laughs> uh, so that, that's Lent, right? Uh, Lent is this time of, uh, of also contemplating mort mortality. And, and you've seen in the newsletter, there's a variety of ways of fasting. And we get this, this glimpse of Jesus in a kind of resurrected glory before we enter into this time. And this matches actually what Mark is doing with this story. From this moment onward, uh, Jesus will begin to tell his disciples, I have to go to Jerusalem and die. And actually what happens immediately after this story uh, is that the disciples go, go down the mountain uh, and they try to do what the gospel of, Matthew, of, of Mark has been telling us that we ought to do. And that is, pick up Jesus' ministry and continue it. So they go down the mountain and they see, they find somebody, they go out doing ministry and they find somebody who has an unclean spirit, much like the stories we've just been hearing the past couple of weeks. And they try to cast out the demon. It doesn't work. So they come back to Jesus and they said, we tried and it didn't work. And Jesus says, it's very Lenten. He says, uh, yeah, this kind of spirit can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. But what it is, it's this moment where ministry just didn't work. And all through, all the way up to the crucifixion, there are going to be these, these moments of failure and disappointment. But before they enter into that part of the story, they see this. Christ in all of his brilliance, in all of his glory, beyond what earth could possibly conjure up. They're given this vision of Jesus before the hard stuff comes. There's another gospel, uh, I believe it's Matthew, uh, who, uh, who tells the same story, and the story that follows it immediately is when they come down the mountain, and, um, uh, and, and then Jesus has one of these moments where he says, if you had enough faith, you could say to this mountain, get up, and it would move. And, and I think part of what's going on in that gospel is it helps us understand what I think Mark's point is also in, in this gospel. To receive that image and to take what we have encountered, what we have seen in faith with us into the difficult times. In other words, in faith, ask this moment on the mountaintop to get up and follow us. It, it is this mountaintop experience. And like if you were one of the kids who went to summer camp, uh, a church camp, I, I didn't really do that. But I've taken kids to camp and I've seen what happens. They have this mountaintop experience. One of the things you have to do as a leader is to help them leave the space that they can't remain in. We all want to be like Peter and say, hey, let's, let's build... Let's build some houses and just stay in this moment. And we all know we can't. And so there's this invitation then to ask the mountain through faith to come with us into the difficult times. I think that's the point for us. Those who get the importance of Jesus, those who see Jesus in that continuity, we already are on that uh, we're, we're on that train. We get that part of it. That's why we're here. But what it does for us now is to remind us to take this with us into Lent, whether it's the, 
the season of Lent that we celebrate liturgically, or it's those Lenten moments in our lives, broken relationships that we have with friends and family. Those moments where some of us have had to make decisions that we didn't want to have to make, whether it's whether we pay this bill or we buy groceries this week. Or when it's when we get that diagnosis that we didn't want to hear. Those moments are when we ask that by faith, this vision of the resurrected Christ would accompany, accompany us into those moments. Those moments when we as a congregation have that ministry just didn't seem to work. We ask that this vision of the resurrected Christ would come with us into those times so that we know what is at the end of the story. Not just this dark and sad moment, not just this challenging moment where things didn't seem to go right. But how the story will end. So we sit with this Markin sandwich, with the, the meat of it, as it were, between the two ends. As we prepare to enter this time of Lent, and we will ask over and over in faith that we may continue to see this bright and gl glowing Christ in our midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.